In order to effectively talk about the stars, we need to be able to identify their locations on the night sky. Pointing your finger and saying, hey, check out that star over there. That one right next to the other one over there isn't always specific enough, unfortunately, especially not in a dark night sky that's full of stars. So both professional and amateur astronomers use several coordinate systems to map the night sky and locate various celestial objects. There are five such coordinate systems, but we will only be focusing on those that are applicable to this course. First, we'll briefly look at the horizontal coordinate system, which uses altitude and azimuth as its coordinates. Then we'll look at the equatorial coordinate system, which uses declination and right ascension. In the horizontal coordinate system, sometimes also called the Alt-As coordinate system because of its coordinates, you are the center. The horizontal coordinate, or the altitude, starts at exactly zero degrees on the horizon, directly in front of you, going upwards to the zenith or the point directly overhead, where the altitude is 90 degrees. The point directly beneath you, if you were able to see all the way through to the other side of the globe, is called the nadir. The coordinate that determines how far to the left or to the right an object may be located is referred to as its azimuth. Measured clockwise from directly due north, azimuth is also given in units of degrees. Say you were stargazing one night, and you wanted to know the position of a bright star in the night sky. You can determine its altitude by measuring how high above the horizon the star appears to be, and determine its azimuth by measuring how many degrees you've had to rotate clockwise from directly due north to face the star. While the horizontal coordinate system may be ideal for stargazing and observations of the night sky with small groups of family or friends, the equatorial coordinate system is preferred by professional astronomers because it does not depend on the observer's location, and it can be used by teams of astronomers working together in various places simultaneously. No matter where we are on Earth, this coordinate system will be the same for us here in Glendale, California, as well as for others observing the skies from anywhere else. Here's why. The equatorial coordinate system is very similar to the geographic coordinate system used right here on Earth with latitude and longitude, except in this case, we have those lines projected on the night sky. In the geographic coordinate system, we have the parallels of latitude that dictate how high above or how far below the equator a certain city or landmark is located. The meridians of longitude tell the positions of places relative to the prime meridian, which runs through Greenwich, England. If we were to expand the parallels and meridians of the geographic coordinate system and superimpose them onto the night sky, we will have basically shrunk the Earth into the center of a giant, imaginary, arbitrary sphere centered around the Earth. This is the celestial sphere. Its similar structure reminds us of latitude and longitude, but instead we see the parallels of declination and the hour circles of right ascension in the place of latitude and longitude respectively. So let's break this down. Declination, which is the equivalent to latitude, is measured in degrees, just the same as latitude itself. It is measured northwards or southwards from the celestial equator, which is located on the celestial sphere directly above Earth's own equator. Right ascension, on the other hand, is the celestial equivalent to longitude. So it is also measured from left to right, but more specifically, it is measured eastward along the celestial equator, the purple circle, starting from the vernal equinox, which is one of the two points at which the celestial equator crosses paths with the ecliptic. Right ascension, unlike declination, is not measured in degrees. Instead, it is measured in hours, minutes, and seconds. Though we can convert from hours to degrees by stating that one hour is equal to 15 degrees of arc. Wait, what? What does that mean? One hour is equal to 15 degrees of arc? That doesn't make any sense. Well, let's look at it this way. One full circle is equal to 360 degrees. So as the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours, it too goes through all 360 degrees in a circle around itself. So if we say that one full revolution is equal to both 24 hours and 360 degrees, then 24 hours itself is equal to 360 degrees. So if we divide both sides of this equation by 24, the 24s on the left side of the equation cancel out, and we get one hour equals 15 degrees of arc. 
Let's use our newly acquired knowledge to determine the exact position of Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, and find it on a star map. The equatorial coordinates of Sirius are given in the column of fast facts about the star on its Wikipedia page. It has a right ascension of 6 hours and 45 minutes and almost 9 seconds, and a declination of negative 16 degrees, 42 arc minutes, and about 58 arc seconds. A negative value for declination means that it lies below the celestial equator. Any star directly on the celestial equator would have a declination of 0 degrees. Take Sa'd al-Malik, for example the brightest star in the Aquarius constellation. It has a declination of zero degrees, meaning that it lies directly on the celestial equator. But let's go back to Sirius. Its right ascension and declination values are given at the top right of the screen, and a star map of the Canis Major constellation and the constellations surrounding it is given on the left. Using this star map, let's verify the coordinates of Sirius. But in order to do this, we need to first understand how to read this star map. Notice that throughout the star map, we have diagonal lines marking the sections of each hour circle going through this patch of the night sky, representing the right ascension values. Right ascension is always read from right to left, because now we are looking at the inside of the celestial sphere. Now take a look at these curves that can be followed from the bottom to the top of the star map. These are the parallels of declination. To verify the declination of Sirius, we draw a curve similar to those already on the map that goes through Sirius. Following it to the left or the right side of the map allows us to read a declination value of a little bit more than negative 16 degrees. So how do we work out these partial degrees? Is it negative 16 and a half? Is it negative 16 and three quarters of the next degree? Well, let's refer to the source to figure it out. According to the Babylonians, who used a base 16 number system, unlike our base 10, one full degree is equal to 60 minutes of arc, and each arc minute can be further broken down into 60 seconds of arc. We use a single prime or single quotation mark to denote arc minutes and a double prime or double quotation marks to denote the arc seconds. This way, we can see that if Sirius sits almost three quarters of the way between negative 16 and negative 17 degrees, then its declination can be determined with finer detail to be about negative 16 degrees and around 45 arc minutes, which it is. But in order to verify the right ascension, we follow the diagonals from the right side of the star map, stopping only when we arrive at Sirius. Looking at either the top or the bottom of the chart, we can read off the values for the star's right ascension and see that it has an RA value of 6 hours and 45 minutes, having gone nearly 3 quarters of the way between the 6th and 7th hour circles. Now, it's your turn. What are the coordinates of Akernar, the brightest star in the constellation Eridanus? Take a close look at the star map on the left and determine which of the given choices is the best representation of Akernar's coordinates. If you look closely, you can see that Akernar's right ascension is between the first and second hour circles, so that removes options A and C as possible answers. Then we take a better look at the declination, which measures in at a value below negative 50 since the declination is in the lowest portion of the chart, so that implies that option D is also not correct. Through this process of elimination, we only have option B left, and that's the correct answer. So if you chose B, well done!